Hey, welcome. I am glad you guys joined us today. Uh, this is this seminar is going to be about how to properly study, and really something that we've lost over time. So believe it or not, this is going to be a great uh, discussion. All right. So unfortunately, as we have moved to a lot more remote means, we have a lot more online classes, a lot more remote classes. Something that we've noticed is that you may not see what the other people are doing. What do I mean by that? I mean that when I went to college, I remember, yeah, there's some online classes, but for the most part, we learned how to study by other people, and a lot of people are still doing this. So one thing that you may not realize is when you're sitting in the classroom, you look at the person next to you and you're like, hey, buddy, how do you do that? What, can you explain that to me? I want to know that meant note-taking method. And we learned because we learned from other people. And a lot of times we forget that this is a skill in and of itself, is how to take notes, how to study, how to take an exam. And we have another video on just how to take uh, exams. We have another lecture that we give here on just how to take exams, so depending on how you're tuning in. Uh, we have those, and I, I, I promise you, they're great. Tune into those, because taking an exam is more than just knowing the knowledge. It's how you read the question. How you read a question is a topic in and of itself, and reading it correctly can determine if you get the right answer um, for that or if you misread something. So uh, do tune into that as well. But today we're going to talk about how to study and how to take notes, two very important topics. So I want to talk about studying first. That's the first thing. So how long do you study for? Where do you study? How do you study? Well, part of this is going to go back to the proper notes and how you tuned into the class and how you paid attention and all of that. But how many of you are actively engaged in the class when it's taking place, when the professor is talking, and they're talking a mile a minute. We all speak a mile a minute. That's just how we talk. We have a lot of information to give to you in a very, very short period of time. And as a result of that, we kind of do have to talk fast. So uh, keeping up is very important. And I'm going to go over note-taking methods that are going to help you keep up. So part one, we're going to talk about study. So, where do you study? Okay? So, where? Okay? And this is studying. Again. Okay? So, where do we study? Um, the next thing. What do we think the next piece of our studying journey is? Right? Not just where, it is when. So when do you study? Pardon my handwriting. So when do we study? What's the next piece? Okay. How do you study? And how long? So we have a lot of factors, and every single one of these plays a significant role in your success as a student. <clears throat> okay, so where do I study? Okay, where? All right, throw it out. How many of you how many of you do all your studying in the classroom? That is where you do your exams, right? So how many of you study in the class? A couple of you? All right. So a couple of you do, do your studying in the class when you get in. If we leave the door unlocked, and you come in and you study? Okay. So um, at home, that's a big, broad term. How many of you study at home? All right. A couple of you study, well, most of you study at home. Okay, I'm seeing a lot more hands go. So most of you are studying at home. All right. 
Now, home's a big category, so we're going to come back to that. How many of you go to the library? All right. Come into hands. Okay. So, not many of you are going to the library. Library is a great resource. Please use it. Okay. Uh, so, I think the library was used a lot more um, before. I, I have noticed a decline in people even entering the library here. Uh, don't forget that that is a significant resource. So please study in the library. Okay, how many of you study at work? How many of you go to work and you're studying? Yeah, a lot of you. Okay, so a lot of you are trying to balance school and you're trying to balance your job at the same time. Right. Okay, so we have a lot. So this is right now, home was the number one, work was number two, we had a few people for library and we had a few people for class. Okay, so now home. How many of you study in the bedroom? Yeah, a lot of you. Okay. How many of you study in the living room? Quite a few of you. Okay. How about the, we can make another line down here. Kitchen. How many of you study on the kitchen? At the kitchen table. Yeah, that's what I thought. All right, so a lot of you. All right, so we're getting a lot of you are going to pick these locations. Now, the most important that we're going to put in the blue is how many of you have a office, a study, an office, a set of place area in your house where you can just study and just do work. That's it. Nothing else takes place in there. You're not watching TV. You're not doing anything else. Maybe you do some crafts, maybe you have a craft room kind of set up. But how many of you have a study, an area set aside to do that? Okay, very, very few of you. So most of you are considering your kitchen, living room, and bedroom, your office, that's your study area. Maybe you have a desk, maybe you don't. So then based off of the sizes of our houses, that's reasonable. Okay. Uh, most of you, you're Pack to the seams, and you are going to have limited space. So I know that this is a rare commodity. I, I respect that. Okay, so those that are studying at work, how many of you have dedicated time during the work day where you can leave the work and you say, I do work from this time to this time, and then this is my time off, but I don't leave the workplace, but I'm doing studies. This is what I do. Maybe I'm tuning into my class remotely. Maybe I'm doing online classes. Uh, I'm actually studying. I'm preparing for exams and doing everything and then I can go back to work uh, during the busy times. But in the middle of the day when there's nothing going on, this is my class time but I don't have to actually leave work. Alright, I'm seeing two hands. Okay. So, how many of you are working at the same time that you're doing it. You're balancing, you're studying. Oh, a phone calls. Oh, hold on, hold on, got an email. Oh, hold on, oh, oh, oh Mrs. Mrs. Smith, I'll help you. What's up? Okay, and you're trying to balance all of that. You're trying to balance work with studies. Yeah, pretty much every hand that, that raised their hand for work is raising their hands right now. What does that tell us? What does that tell us about our dedication? What does that tell us about our priorities? I'm not, I'm not dissing anybody. I'm not, I'm not saying you're doing anything wrong. I'm going to teach you how to do it right. So, is are you getting the best study environment if you're trying to balance that? No. So there is value to leaving the workplace and saying, look, I have to go to class. I have to be in the classroom. I have to learn. Uh, I can't do this remotely, I can't do this online, I have to actually physically be in a classroom because for me, this is a distraction and tell my employer that I can't be here it means that they can't give me work um, and that I have to dedicate my time. So there is value to taking class as a person for that reason, it's just to escape um, some of that environment. All right, so what about this home environment and this work environment? 
what kind of environment does that does that come up? So, first of all, what is the bedroom for? Bed, exactly. Yeah, you go to sleep. What's your living room for? Relaxation. Okay, good. Okay, relaxation. TV. Okay, this is the family space. The kitchen. What do we do in the kitchen? Again, okay. Eat. So we eat. So what are we doing when we're in the bedroom? What are you thinking about when you're in that bedroom? What are you thinking about? Yeah, hey, you're thinking about going to bed, right? So, so we're thinking about sleep. But you're sitting there and you're studying. And I remember as a child, my I have a dedicated office at home now. I need one. But I remember, you know, the space, right? There's a three-bedroom home. There's uh, parents. There's me and my brother. We have our things. So me and my brother, yes, our office. My parents had their separate offices. Uh, me and my brother, yeah, typical. You have you have a desk within your bedroom. And that's just where you do your studies. That's where I do my homework. But there is value to trying to meet that. If you do have that, that's fine. Have your, uh, have your having your desk in there, a place that you can work, a place that you can do your studies. That's perfect. But when you're really trying to study and trying to get away, you need to find another space, okay? Because what are we doing? We're in that bedroom, and while you're working, you're just in that room where you're like, oh, I'm so tired. The bed is calling me. Calling me to the seas. The sailor, you ever seen those sailors? You know, they go up to the sea, right? Because the mermaids are the sirens, the mermaids, the sea monsters are calling them to the sea, right? So, the bed is calling me. I'm going, I'm tired. And what do you do? You land up laying down. I know I do. Um, I've done many times, right? So, you're laying on the bed and you're like, yeah, I can study. Yeah, I'm trying to learn my laptop. Yeah, I'm paying half attention. Right? But before you know it, you're just not in the mood. You're in a different place mentally. It's mental. You have to get into your head and you have to determine where is the best place for me to learn. What am I doing over here? Same thing, right? I'm not sitting in some rigid chair that's keeping me awake. Maybe my, maybe my desk is in the living room and that's fine. Maybe you have an office space and there's a whole book within the living room and it's carved out and you say, this is a space where I study. That's fine. You can do that. How many of you are laying on the couch or in the recliner chair? <clears throat> I got my laptop and I'm working, right? Yeah, most of you. Yeah, exactly what I expected, all right? So that is a space where we relax. That's a space. How many of you put the TV on while you're studying? Yeah, I know, I do the same thing. So, but, so we, so while we are studying, we're distracted. We're looking up. We want to miss a little. Hold on. I got to rewind. I do that a lot. Oh, I got to rewind. Hold on. I missed something. I was paying attention to my computer. I wasn't paying attention to that TV. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's exactly what I wanted, right? All right. So, so again, you're laying on the couch. You're in a different mood. You're relaxed. You're too relaxed. You can't be too relaxed because that puts us in a mood where your mind is not thinking about studying. And the kitchen is for food. So how many of you are doing that? You're hungry. You're eating the entire time. Now, something I'm going to tell you, right? And I realize that some of you are taking your exams from the same place that you're studying, right? If you are doing remote or online classes. But many of you are going to go on. I know those that in this room, you're all going to go on for a licensure exam someday. I hope you go on for your licensure exam some days. Okay? That's very important. But where is that licensure exam given? It's given, yeah, it's given in a rigid testing center. It's given in a testing center where you're going to walk in and you're going to be fingerprinted, you're going to be ID'd. It's very strange. You're going to go in, they're going to be quiet. I remember when I went in for my exams, I was wearing sandals. I wanted to be comfortable. I wanted shoelaces tying me up and cutting off my circulation. No tie, nothing. I just went in. A t-shirt, sandals. Not to be unprofessional. Just to be relaxed. To take a good exam. And what did I do? I had to take my sandals off because they were too noisy. <laughs> and they made me take them off because they were too noisy to go into the testing center. All right? Because you go in and people taking exams in there. And they're in these little cubicle spaces. They're on the computer and it's, it's Really, really dead quiet. Um, 
So if you're used to taking exams and you're used to studying and doing your work in a busy, noisy environment, an environment that has the TV, the radio, if you're chewing gum, if you're eating, if you're drinking, hopefully water, but still drinking, if you're doing anything other than in a quiet, strict environment where you're focusing on that work and you're focusing on that exam and nothing but that exam, no noise, nothing, no people in the background, then when you go to take your licensure exam, it's going to be much harder for you because your minds have a recall that is based off of situations. So if you are drinking liquor, yes, I've seen some of you do it. Okay, we do watch the Proctor videos. Drinking liquor while taking their exams. And you were drinking liquor while studying. It's amazing, you did a great job. Yeah, why? Because your recall was based off of the liquor. Yeah, you didn't think I was watching, did you? All right? But if you're studying and you're drinking, got my mess bourbon, yeah, got an old fashioned next to me, maple old fashioned next to me. I'm enjoying that. It's my study drink. It relaxes me, allows me to study. But then I go into that exam. And when I go to take that exam, I'm not able to drink. I'm not able to chew gum. I'm not able to listen to my favorite songs. I don't have a TV on. And as a result, I don't do well. Why? Because my recall was based off of the situation. So where's the best place to study? The best place to study is the same environment in which you're going to take the exam. Go to the library. Put yourself in a cubicle and study in the cubicle. Get used to studying with things on blinders on the sides. In a quiet environment, nobody speaks. The library. You have extracted there. And get used to that. Because that's the environment you're going to take your licensure exam. Okay? Don't you go. Don't drink. Don't eat. Study. But that's only part of study. Because I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to contradict what I'm about what I just said. Okay? But when you're studying, you need to put yourself into these environments. But there's a couple of different factors that play a role in study. Okay, so that is where. Check. Okay, oops, that was not a good check. I don't like that check. We're going to go with a better check. So, check. Okay, where? Okay, so we covered where do we study. How about when do you study? You know, I have a tough day at home. I eat. Um, I'm going to study late at night. That's my thing. I'm a night owl. I love to study at night. Or I love to get up in the morning. Well, first thing in the morning, uh, stretch, then I study. Okay, we all have a different method. We all play different games with our minds. But when you study is important. And what am I going to tell you? I'm going to tell you to always study every minute of the day. And never stop studying. Professor Shad, how do you expect me to study every minute of the day? I got a job. I go to go to class. I gotta feed my family. I got kids. I gotta bring them to daycare. I got that. How do you expect me to study every minute of the day? I can't do that. But you can. So, when do we study? So, this is gonna go into how long do you study? I'm gonna I'm gonna answer how long do you study first. Okay. So here's our little chart. So how how long do you guys study? Okay. So right now we're at peak. This is this axis is how much attention I have, how much focus I have, how much energy I have in my studies. Okay. I'm gonna call that energy slash focus. Okay. So that's your energy and focus line. Okay. What do we think this is? Time, right? So we have time. So how much time over time do we study? How long are you studying for? So if I were to 
Get my energy. And initially I start off, right? And yeah, I'm doing great. Oh, yeah, I'm doing great. Yep, yep. Okay, and it plummets. Okay? It plummets over time. I'm not going to put any time factors there. I'm just going to leave that there for you. It plummets over time. So if you think I'm going to sit there and I'm just going to cram for hours and I'm going to learn something, no, you're not. It shows right here. You're not going to. My chart. My chart just told you so. Okay? You're not going to learn over time. It's not happening. So what do we do? Okay? We learn in pieces. Energy. Okay? Guess what? I can I might lose it a little bit, but I'm still maintaining my energy. Because I'm measuring in small bits, but do I know that I'm studying? No, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it like that. So now, that's not long. So now we're going to when. Then we're going to get to how. So when do I study? Okay. Again, all the time. Check. So now, the most important part of it: how do I study? How, Professor Shane, do you expect me to study all throughout the entire day? How do you expect me to do this when I have other things to do? It's not when, it's how. How do we do this? Well, first of all, if you're sitting there and you are just cramming, you're looking at the book, all right, I'm gonna sit down, I'm just gonna read the book. And when I read that book, I'm gonna know everything. I've been doing this for years. I went to kindergarten, first grade, second grade, it worked for me. Because you thought you were studying, and you were regurgitating things. You were regurgitating things out of short-term memory. But do you truly remember those things well after the fact? Or did you remember them for that exam? Now, I've been known from time to time to throw a bold question on my quizzes, on my exams. And why do I do that? Because I want you to continue learning, right? So I want you to keep going back. I don't want you to think about chapter one for next week. I lecture about chapter one now and you regurgitate it next week. And you learn chapter two and you regurgitate it the following week. But when you get to the midterm and the final, do you know that? When you get to your licensure exam, do you know that? No. You don't. Because you regurgitated what you did. You studied it and you regurgitated it. And what are you doing? You're studying just before the exam. That's short-term memory. You're tapping into short-term memory. Not the long-term stuff. We need to commit to long-term memory. So how do we do that? We, over time, keep repeating, repetition, but getting it in small bite-sized pieces. Making a part of your life, making a part of everyday life, means that it's going to start committing that to longer memory. Because you're going to repeat it over and over and over again, but you're not going to stress yourself doing it. You're going to start relating it to things. Because after time, your energy goes down, but so does your retention. Your retention goes down as well. So what happens is you start reading things, and you think you're reading it. You think you're remembering all of it. You're not. You think so. But what's really happening is that you're remembering what you just read. Oh, yeah, I remember that. I just read it. So what I want you to do is I want you, if you think that that's happening, and you think you're the best studier that ever happened, you're the best study methods, because this always works for you. You always ace your quizzes. What I want you to do is you're going to read a chapter of the book, textbook. Pick any chapter. Read a chapter of that textbook. Well, two, three, four weeks later. Keep on working. I want you to go back and look at the first page and tell me, do you remember that? Chances are you will. Chances are you're going to remember that page. First of all, it was the first page, so you're probably most attentive to that page. But, without flipping the page, I want you to tell me what's on, chap what's on page two. And I want you to tell me what's on page three of that chapter. And if you can do that, that means you remembered it. But if you cannot remember everything on the next couple pages, you got deja vu. What you have is you're looking at something 
and you're recognizing it. That's recognition. That is not recall. That's recognition. You're recognizing what you see. Oh yeah, I've seen that before. I know that. You don't know. You recognized it. So what I want you to do is I want you to recall. I want you to understand it. And the best way to recall something is to understand it, to know it. So how do we get there? How do we recall this information and not just make it recognizable? Because you know what? When I ask that question on the exam, when your other professors ask that question on that exam, they're not using those words. Maybe they do. Maybe they took it right from the textbook. I've done that from time to time. But when you get asked that question differently, especially on the national board exam, that's rewritten how many times? So when you go and take your other exams and all of a sudden you wonder why you don't recognize something, it's because they took the same question and they wrote it a different way. And when you ask something a different way, all of a sudden you, the student, don't know you read it. You don't know the material. And why don't you know the material? It's the same question. Because it was asked in a different way. Somebody else asked it. It wasn't what you heard during lecture. It wasn't what you heard or you read in the book. But it was the same information. You just didn't know it. So, how do we prevent that? Okay. So what you're going to do is different study methods. One, okay, how many of you pick a, using flashcards or whatever it is, and you write all those flashcards. And when you write out those flashcards, at the very end, you don't have time to study. Right? How many of you wrote out those flashcards, but you never gave your time, yourself time to actually study that material? Yeah, many of you. Many of you did that. So, how do we fix that problem? What can we do better to ensure that everything we take we remember? That we have time to study the materials that we make? Yeah, I could steal it from my colleagues. We all work together. We all pitch in. There's methods where you could do group notes. Those are amazing. That's great. One student opens a shared document and you can all collaborate. Okay? Because you're taking notes and somebody else is adding in. You have to get a good group. People that are going to work together well. But you can take group notes. Right? I type something and someone else is maybe typing something else. Maybe you focus on different parts and someone else writes parentheses with a question mark because they missed something and somebody else can go back and explain it. Or someone else can write, oh, he meant this. Oh, this was from prior lecture. So they can add pieces in, right? You can take terms, taking notes, and other people are reading them and they're filling in the blanks. And you can get everything. It's great. But I'm going to teach you in a minute how to take proper notes. That's another topic. But for now, again, how do I study? Well, I take index cards. I can take sticky notes. Okay? I take little post notes. And that's what I do. I might write a term on one side or a definition on the other. And then I just take that pen. I don't walk around. There was days where I remember walking around with a flashcard. They were this big because I remember being in classes where you could be asked anything from one. That was just one class's flashcards. They were this big. I'm not kidding you. I carried them around. And you would have piles and piles and boxes and boxes of these because you never stopped learning because you could have been asked something from freshman year your last day senior year. I see value in that. But what happens is, again, you write the flashcards, you don't have time to study them. So I make these post notes, just quick terms, only the ma major terms, nothing big. I'm not doing every little thing. I'm doing, I'm doing the main topics of something. And when you do the main topics of something, you doesn't take as long. And you could, you could write yourself certain questions. That's it. So I can say, how many bones are in the human body? All right. Simple. So now the other side may have the answer. 
but then what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to stick these post notes, everything, my steering wheel, my dashboard, to the door frame of my bedroom, to the kitchen, right? Stick them to the microwave door, stick them to whatever you can. Spread them out. Stick them to the laundry, uh, in the laundry area of your house, wherever it be. So now, what you're going to do is every time you go into the bedroom, you take a post note, you read the first side, go in there, don't think of anything else, right? Maybe you're folding clothes to put in your dresser, and while you're folding those clothes to go in your dresser, you're just thinking about that question. You're just thinking about that turn, right? Give yourself a few minutes. Really think about, oh, let me think. You can maybe answer that question. Maybe it was a quick question. Oh, I know how many quick phones. Okay, yeah, I got the right answer. Great, excellent. But while I'm in that bedroom, I'm not taking another flashcard. I'm not taking another thing. That's what a lot of us do. We get one flashcard, oh, I got the answer. All right, what's the next one? What's the next one? What's the next one? We're rapid fire, machine gunning. Boom, 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 everything in our heads. Okay? And you didn't retain it. You short-term memoried everything. So what do we do? You take that note, and we read that note. And now I know how many bones are in the human body. Answered it. But then what I did was while I'm making the bed, stripping the bed, while I'm putting things in my dresser, folding my clothes, whatever the case may be, maybe I went down to the laundry area and I was getting a post-it note there, maybe I'm cooking dinner and I took a post-it note off of my microwave, so whatever I'm doing, I'm focusing only on that. While I cook dinner, all I'm thinking about is that. So now, even though I asked about how many bones, I'm thinking to myself, hmm, let me see. Can I name the bones? Let me start. I'll name all the bones in the hand and the arm. Let me name all the bones in the leg. Let me name all the ones on the torso, the head. Cool. Now, you don't necessarily have the right answer in, your, in front of you, and that's okay. What you're doing is you're thinking about it. You're trying to see. You're trying to recall. You're trying to get yourselves to think about that topic for an extended period of time. But you're not doing it by reading something and go, oh, yeah, yeah, I knew that, I knew that. No, because you recognized it. Oh, yeah, I knew that. Yeah. What you're doing is you're letting your mind do the thinking. You're letting your mind, your brain, try to see what you know or don't know. And you're really in a relaxed way. You're all joking about getting, you're thinking about this stuff. But you know what? Because you're thinking about it, you're imagining it, you're starting to understand it. You're starting to get that in your head in a way that you understand it. Because you're applying it in that way. So, so that's very important, okay? Understanding. So now, on the other note, you could have people ask questions, right? I've had, I'm driving, someone needs something, I've handed my book to someone. Handed my note cards, handed my whatever to someone else, and I said, Hey, run us through and find me questions. Because you know what they do? They run through that textbook, they find a random chapter, and they read something. But they read it in a way that they're asking it. They don't know the material. Maybe they do, maybe they're class, maybe, maybe they're not. But they maybe don't know that information. So they're going to ask you that question in a different way. That's great. They read it and then they regurgitate. They ask you a question based off of something they just read, a sentence, a paragraph. And then you have to give them that information. Or maybe you have to explain it. Have them ask a question. Say, I don't understand that. I just read this paragraph and it's about time weighted averages, permissible exposure limits. I don't understand that. Can you explain that to me? Because you're not just saying, what is the permissible exposure limit? What is the time weighted average? Oh, it's two. Oh, that's that's seven five. That's point seven five. That's point five, right? Those are numbers. You're regurgitating numbers. But did you understand what those things meant? Hey, I just read this. Can you explain that to me? Oh yeah, absolutely. So the permissible exposure limit is the limit at which hey, you had to explain it. You had to put that into words. Oh, it's the time weighted average. Oh, the time weighted average is that they take your exposure to formaldehyde for over eight hours, average it out, so it's always the smaller number. Okay? Because it's a smaller number because the because your short-term exposure limit is two, because that's over 15 minutes. So we take the worst part of an embalming and we and we measure that. That's two. Two parts per million. But my time weighted average, because it's an average over eight hours. 
that's a smaller number because if the average taking the taking the, the the really high exposures and the really low exposures over eight hours, and that that averages it to a lower number, 0.5, I have to have signage on my prep room door and I have to wear a mask. 0.75, I have to shut that prep room down because 0.75 parts per million that's that's too high, that's above the limit. So now when I shut it down, now I have to fix that problem. Do you think you understood it? When you explain that to your friend, do you think you now understood what time weighted average, permissive exposure limits, short-term exposure limits? Do you think you understood that? Yeah, because you had to explain it. You had to put that into words. Okay? Get up and give a lecture. That's the best way to study as well. Okay? The dog, your friends, your family. An empty room, whatever it is, okay? So get up and instead of just reading the book, play professor for that day. Get up and talk. Talk to the stuff, put your stuffed animals. Get your kids, it doesn't matter how old they are, they don't even understand this. Have them sit there. Talk to them, lecture to them. Okay? And what you're gonna do, or just get your friends, they don't even nowadays, you don't even need people in the room. I used to do this for my parents growing up. I wanted to learn something. They'd watch their shows at night, and then I had the commercials. Okay, there was no DVR back then, so there was we had commercials. So what you did, and you can fast forward to them. <laughs> so, so what I would do is I would sit there and I would study, and then my my parents would say, "All right, you have a commercial," and I'd get up and I they they mute the TV and I'd stand in front of the TV. And I would lecture, maybe that's why I'm a professor today, but I would lecture to them about a topic that they could care less about. But I would lecture to them about the chapter I just read, or about the paragraphs I just read. Or I'd watch a video and I would lecture back to them what I just learned. Because I had to explain it. When you have to explain things, it puts it in a different part of your brain. It helps you understand things different than if you just read. Reading is one part of your brain. Speaking is another part of your brain. Watching is a third part of your brain. So use and listening, different parts of your brain. Okay, so using all those parts of your brain is so important. Use them all. So now you, you, you lecture, you talk. Have them ask questions. Hey, I don't understand that. Can you explain that to me? Or maybe they want to go back to TV. Now they can just pause things at DVR. But maybe you get back and say, all right, next commercial. And when the next commercial comes up, they're going to ask you questions. All right, hey, you talked about this. Can you explain that more? I didn't understand that. Hey, you said this. Did you mean this, this, and this? Is that how that works? Maybe they understand it. Maybe they don't. Maybe they can ask educated questions. Maybe they're just asking you questions. But you know what? Every time you explain something, you're going to explain it in a way that helps you all of a sudden go, Aha! You hear that aha moment? Those aha moments are extremely important to you understanding material. It's incredible. Use these opportunities. How else can I study? Well, I can visualize things. So, if your hand is supine, okay, supine, palm straight up, palm down your side, anatomical position. Ta da! Okay, so when I'm in anatomical position, my palm is straight up, palm holds soup. Right? Soup ball. Boom. Like that. Okay. Supine. Okay. Body face up. Supine. Body face down. Body back up. It would be prone, right? So if I were to take my hands and I were to flip that over, my hand is now prone. Supine. Prone. Okay. So now, right now, my radius is on my thumb side of my arm. My ulna is on the pinky side of my arm. Pretty straightforward here. Okay. So, supine. I flip my hands. Okay. Rotate it. I can only rotate it one way. It doesn't go the other way. So I rotate it. When I rotate my arm, my quiz question for you is which bone is on top, the radius or the ulna? So what are you going to do? You're during the middle of your quiz and you're going, and you're thinking, right? Because you're flipping your hand over. You're doing this. I, I, I love this. I always look at students when I taught anatomy, it looked like they were doing a harder hand. Okay? Because they're, 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 they're looking, all right, what, they're feeling the bone. <laughs> they really do look like a harder hand. Okay, they're feeling bones, they're feeling things, they're doing whatever. Okay, it looks like they're dancing in their seat. They're not cheating. What they're doing is practical application to answer that question. You're taking it. I asked you a question when I take my hand and go from, from, from supine to prone, which bones are bone? 
the radius, right? Boom, that bone. It went like this and it twist over. Okay? But you, you learn that. And you guess what? You're practicing in your head because you're using practical application to apply that. That's okay. You're allowed to do that. You're not cheating. Okay? So you have notes on your hands, you're cheating. But you're not. Your practical application. Feeling the bones and go, okay, temporal, parietal, occipital. You know what? It's okay because you made a dance out of it. I used to do this all the time. Okay? Right? You learned as a kid, right? The knee bones connected to the, right? <laughs> so, so it's okay to touch certain parts of your body and properly and, um, and attribute that to something. It's okay. But the, one of the better study techniques, and you'll learn this if you hang out with a lot of health science majors, and I was one at one point um, in my career as well, before I went into uh, dental care. And when you go down the dorm roads, you can tell who the nursing, physical therapy, occupational therapy, radiology majors are. Because you can tell by the drawing. They have, you know, like I said, they have large windows in their dorm rooms. And they got their roommate scrawled up against the window and they're using dry erase markers or chalk or whatever and they're drawing on the window. Right? And they're draw as they draw on the window, they're drawing the outline and then they're starting to label the silhouette that they've created. They're like, like okay, this is where that bone is, that's where the and they're drawing on the thing. You know what they're learning? Because you have to label this life science body. And one of the other methods is, and I always love this, you get invited some over to someone's dorm room. Uh, when I was a student, that is. And they get invited over to get drawn on. Hey, come over in your bikini. All right, you need nothing. I wasn't wearing the bikini, but um, but you get invited over because they needed someone to draw on, right? All right, come over in your swim trunks, come over in your shorts. And what you would do is you take paint or marker or something, something that came off, and we would paint. All right, these are the arteries, these are the veins. Label, this is where they can tell, you know, we have hair, I don't have much anymore, but you know, you could draw, all right, this is what bones are. You're drawing with, you know, this bone's here, this bone's here. Because when you have to actually, rather than looking at a textbook, when you have to actually blindly label all the bones and then you check your work later, it puts it to a whole different perspective when you have to learn something. Or you're learning a position, you're learning a different thing, right? Okay, this is where these, I'm drawing the muscles, I'm drawing the arteries, I'm drawing the veins that attribute to that. These are all excellent study techniques that help you study. So how, okay? All right. So again, studying is a, is a huge, um, huge thing and uh, there's a lot more to it. So now we need to come back to how do we take notes. Note taking is something that I found, besides studying, that I've seen die out. People are not taking proper notes. Uh, the amount of students that have asked me said, hey, I don't understand why I failed the quiz. Did you study? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. So tell me, how did you study? How did you study? Well. I looked at your PowerPoints and I sat through your lecture. Okay. Did you look at the textbook? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I read through the chapter. Okay. So you read through the chapter. Did you study the chapter? Did you actually study the chapter? I read it. I looked at your PowerPoints. My PowerPoints had the bold words at the top of the chapters and the chapter of the paragraphs. And then I lectured based off of that. I provided you a lecture based off of those topics. Those bold words didn't give you any information. Those bold words kept me on pace, told me what the next thing that I needed to teach was. And it helped you know where things were. And if I share those PowerPoints, which I sometimes do, then it gave you a place to start your notes because then you could, you could draw on the PowerPoint and give notes that attributed to those old words that I already gave you. But in no way was that studying. That's why you failed. So how do we take proper notes? Because this is where you get the information. So there's a couple different methods to taking proper notes. Now you can take notes using PowerPoint, Word, 
Um, you know, we have the apps Good Notes and Notally and all of that. Okay, they're all excellent methods to take notes. Um, nothing beats actually having paper, but I'm going to tell you right now. Uh, well, as you exhibit A, my handwriting's not the best, so reading it back was not the best either. So yes, I can type uh, probably faster, but I'm missing things, and now you're dealing with technology. Of you can't just go from here to here. You kind of have to work with that. And PowerPoint, I think, is good because you can start text boxes all over the place. And, uh, you can keep things pre-organized. I can create columns. I can do whatever I need using professional note-taking software like GoodNotes and Notally and uh, some of these others that are coming out um, are excellent. Okay, They're excellent software, uh, and they do allow you to draw in different places. They allow you to take the electronic version of uh, the paper that we used to use or we still use and allowing you to have some form. Some of them will change my chicken scratch into real letters. Um, and sometimes they don't understand a word that I just wrote, so sometimes they write it wrong, right? But how do we how do we prepare? This is the most important thing. How do you prepare your notepads? Because walking into the classroom with a blank piece of paper and expecting to take notes and then wondering where things are, not the best note taken. So how do we prepare? So we take a piece of paper. Okay, so here's your piece of paper. Now there's a couple different methods. I'm going to put them side by side, but these are different methods that you can use um, to do this. So the first one is more for studying, um, going back and studying. So you have a narrow column, and then I would put two larger columns. So you can actually take your paper and you can fold it, or you can pre-create like a electronic template. Like if you're in one of these things maybe create a template that does exactly this um, and then you can always just open that and create a notebook for your class with that uh, but the traditional way would be to literally just take your um, your notepad and you know just fold the pages so that they have creases on them um, and or take a ruler and draw lines on them that's how we traditionally do that the other method would be a three column method but they're a little bit more equal in their columns so now you can use different colors, and that's the best part of this. Okay, so I'm going to use. So now I'm going to take notes prior to class. I'm going to look through the book, and I'm going to pick out the major topics. I'm going to pick out everything that is that I that I should know. All right. So now um, you can you can do two different things. I can. Um, I can break things up in different ways, but let's say this different method would be to, let's say I wrote, okay, before class, TWA, um, and then, you know, time, weighted average, um, Pell, permissible exposure limit, I'm going to write that out, Stell, um, you know, short term, I'm going to write that out, okay. Um, so I'm going to write that out ahead of time. This is preparing for lecture. This is the, I went through the textbook, I read things. Now, I didn't have to read the chapter. And that's the misconception. I didn't have to read the entire chapter. What I had to do was skim through and find major points. Okay? So now what I'm going to do is I, I, I kind of put these close together, but I could space them out a little bit more, uh, give myself plenty of space, because I'm going to need this column, and I'm going to need space to write in this column. So in this, I'm going to space these out more than I just did. But I'm going to write these, and I'm going to basically write major topics. The, the head of the, uh, of the paragraph, the head of the chapter, the head of the paragraph. Um, I'm going to write some minor, minor information, right? So now, over here, I could write, you know, 0.5 is this, 0.75 is this, um, and then, you know, my short-term exposure limit is two parts per million, and I can write. So I'm going to leave, but again, I'm leaving big spaces between everything that I'm writing. Again, I can keep those calls together, but I'm going to leave big spaces. Because what I'm going to want is I'm going to want space on that far right side to write a lot more. So I've basically pre-taken all my notes. I've gone through the textbook. I've pre-taken notes because, again, we talk very fast during the lecture. We have a lot of information to give you in a short period of time. We get excited. We talk fast. So. What we're going to do is you're going to you're going to leave yourself major spaces, 
but you're going to have pre-taken those notes because anything you wrote already, you now don't need to write again. We don't need to rewrite something that we've already written. And otherwise, you're going to lecture and you're going to be writing, I can't keep up, go back, I can't keep up, professor. And take pre notes. Go back. Start taking pre notes. Take my notes. I went through the chapter and I took my notes at it. Now, what I'm going to do, I changed, I did that in purple. You don't have to use purple, I just messed the markers I have available to me. So I'm going to use green, okay? Again, just it doesn't matter the colors, but use different colored pens um, so that you know what you did during lecture and what you did. So now I'm going to go back and I can add in this and I can add in that and I can do all of this work in these spaces and I'm going to use a different color when I'm taking notes during lecture. So now I know what came beforehand and I know what came during lecture. Or if you're the one that can balance pens, then that's even better because now you can say, all right, bold topics. I can do a head nod. I can say bold topics, even though if I wrote it in here, bold topics were in one color. Um, like the information, so time weighted average, and then I write what that time weighted average the numbers are in a different color. Uh, I write the explanation of what time weighted average is in a third color. I did that all ahead of time. All of that's done before I even made it to lecture because it's going to make it easier to find, right? Otherwise, I just have one color. So I'm indenting, I'm doing an outline form, right? I'm keeping things organized. But, you, you know, indent things, keep things very organized, and using out specific outline form really does help keep things organized during a lecture. But, and leaving yourself plenty of space to write more on. Now, that fourth color is during the lecture where you're saying, okay, I'm adding this in. But what it does is your lecture, you're writing so quick that you're all over the place. So you're not going to keep things as organized as what you would have done before. So that fourth color means, okay, this is the scribble work, but it doesn't distract from the initial colors, the initial three colors that you were using, four colors, five colors, whatever you were using, that allowed you to keep things organized. But it's going to add in the extra details. Oh, the professor gave an example of this. The professor said this. The professor said that. Right? And you're giving real life examples or you're giving an explanation. Maybe the professor explained it in a different way than the textbook that said, ah, that made sense. And then you were able to write that in there. So that's what happened. Now, after lecture, you come back. So now we already have multiple colors, we have multiple spaces. Hopefully you left yourself plenty of space to write these things. You go back with a additional color or maybe the original colors or whatever you do. Okay? Keep, keep things minimal, but at the same time. Keep things organized. So now I go back with the original colors, and I now fill in spaces and say, hey, let me look back at the textbook. Now that I've skimmed the textbook, I've taken notes based off my skimming, I've taken, I've gone to lecture, I filled in spaces based off that lecture, and now I am going back and I'm saying there was a part I didn't understand. Let me try to find the answer. Maybe it's not in the textbook. Maybe I need to look it up. Maybe I Google it. Maybe I do something, but I look up that answer. And now I'm going to go in and I'm going to fill in the things that I didn't get from lecture or from the book. Now you have complete notes. Now you have a complete system because now that is complementing each other. You can't just do one. You can't expect to get everything from lecture. You can't expect everything from the book. You need to get everything from all of it. And then go back and fill in those spaces. Yes, it takes time. Proper planning, proper coursework takes time. So I have I have a good friend, my, my best friend. Um, he was he's an engineer and his um, roommates were well, engineers as well. So very mathematical people. All right. So he walked in. He says, "All right." His roommate says, "You know, I'm I'm, I'm wondering um, what it takes to get an A versus a B versus a C versus a whatever." Okay. So he walks in. He says, "All right, an A it takes." Um, you know, I'm just, I'm not going to use numbers, but it takes, you know, uh, you know, this really high uh, level, you know, on the scale or whatever. It takes somewhere up here on this scale in order to get, um, you know, to get an A, right? Versus where do we, you know, you have an, an A minus, um, you have a, you know, B plus uh, B uh, 
of you know B minus. I'm going to start overlapping them a little bit. Um, you know, you have a C uh, plus whatever. So as you're going down, they get closer to closer together. But they said the different. He figured out. He asked people. He went around and surveyed people and said, "How long do you study?" How much do you do? What kind of studying do you do? Um, and it wasn't just like, oh, yes, I sit there and I spend 60 hours a week just focusing on a book. It was, how much time do you take preparing, right? I take this much time preparing my notes so that I can go to lecture, then I go to lecture, and I then I go back, um, you know, and I review the notes, and I fill in the spaces that I'm missing, and I do all of that. I look up, if there was something I didn't understand, I look it up, and I fill in that information. Uh, it's it's all about that. We don't get you're not going to get the retention that you from typing that you will from handwriting. By the way, okay. So if you have a tablet, you can handwrite on the tablet to these uh, note taking software or make your own. Or if you're using a notepad, your retention for long term is much better. It's proven much better than your typing. Your typing does not have that same retention level. But looking at this, the gap between an A and an A minus is significant. It takes significantly more hours of dedication to get from an A minus to an A than it would from a B plus to an A minus. And B to a B plus and B minus to, you know, and over time, if there's the lower grades, you're taking very little differences between getting a D and a C. There's very little difference in the amount of time you put in. But when we get to these higher grades, and if that's what you want to strive for, then you should. It's going to take um, extraordinary amounts of difference in dedication in order to get from this grade to that. That's why we see most people, if you look at a grade book, uh, any professor can look at their grade book, and their grade book should look like, uh, you know, if you have, uh, let's say, here's 100, um, 90, 80, 70, 60, 50, and we'll just skip down to like 20. Okay, so any professor's grade book typically should, usually doesn't start at the hundreds, but usually you see, you know, a few people around the 90, it peaks around the 80, 70, and then it goes down, and then it, you know, kind of jumps up a little bit, you know, in a few, few places. But most grade books without any carbon, without any work, you have a good, well-designed course if the grade book is, you know, has a few people, you know, in the high 80s um, to 90s. Uh, majority of the people, you know, you have majority of the people around that 80s. Like so, so mid 80s to, um, you know, to mid 70s. This is where you see the biggest peak in a grade book. Um, you should only have a few people above that mid 80s, and you should have only a few people. Uh, between that uh, mid 70s and uh, you know maybe a 70, uh, there should be a few people around there, and then you have like one two students that land up below. It. Obviously, harder classes tend to have people more this way, but a well-designed class means that it's it, it was well designed that it would in a way that you learned um, enough people are learning. A lot of you know the best students are around that 80 because that's the average. Yeah, 80 is an average point. And then you have um, a few people that excelled and a few people that didn't put the effort in. And then you have a few people that are not really sure if they took the class or not, but they're, they're somewhere down here. Uh, but that's the B. <coughs> so, sorry. so, but the big difference in that is who do you think is in this group? That group in the 90s, you see that this is the people that are putting in average effort. The people down here are thinking that this class is easy, and that's why they're in the 70s, because they're not putting the effort in. The people in the 90s, their notes are impeccable. Their notes are there. They're studying. They're looking things up. They're the ones that come to me and say, Professor, you're wrong. No, I'm not. Explain to me why I'm wrong. And you know what? They explain it. And you know what? Sometimes I am wrong. I'm not infallible. But oftentimes they are wrong. And that's okay. Because you know why? That person that was in the 90s is the person coming to me. Not these people. Why are they coming to me? They're coming to me because they feel like they know the right answer. They are able to understand it enough that they're able to argue with me, that they're able to debate with me over why that answer should be right. 
And I'll point out the factor, but you know what? I love it when they come. Because I'm able to point out the one factor in that question or the textbook. I've had a case where the, you know, they point out they point out the textbook. Hey, the textbook's wrong. No, it's not. Now other people may agree with you that the textbook's wrong. And there are sometimes we do find errors in a textbook, and we call the author and we let the author know. But sometimes it's not. Sometimes you read it wrong. You understood something. You read something different, and you understood it differently. But you know what? That gave me the opportunity to point out and say, you're right. That is right, except you missed this one factor. This one factor is what determined if that was right or wrong. That one factor changed the entire sentence. But you know what? They came to me because they understood it. They came to me because they felt that they knew the answer. These students aren't going to come to me. These students are taking that answer at face value and saying, oh, must be right. They wrote it. The professor put it there. Must be right. And they're not willing to challenge it because they're just taking that answer at face value. And you know what they're doing? They're not studying the material. When you get a quiz, <coughs> Sorry. When you get a quiz and you may have gotten things wrong, don't go back and study the quiz. Don't. You know, questions change. You're not studying the quiz. You're not studying those questions. You're studying the concepts. Study the concepts. Don't study the quiz. Okay? Don't ask me to see the quiz. I'll show you what you got wrong. I'll tell you what you got wrong. I'll tell you where to focus. But if all you're studying is studying the questions from the prior quiz, expecting to do well on your midterm and your final, the question's changed. So don't. When you get your licensure exam, totally different questions. Not even the same. So don't study them. Don't expect them. I teach the board competency class. And what do you do? You take that, oh, well, these are the questions. You're memorizing questions. No! You're never going to see these questions. Nobody knows what's on that exam. You can't. It's a secret. So don't study those. What you do is you figure out the these people figured out the concepts that they didn't understand. They didn't go back and just study quizzes waiting for the next exam. They looked at the concept, went back to the book, went, they looked online, they looked at other books, they went to the library, they found the resources, they found the answers. And when they found those answers, they when they found those answers. They took notes. They added them to their notes. But it wasn't the question. It was the concept. Because it wasn't that question is so narrow focused on a specific thing. If you don't understand that question, you probably don't understand the concept that surrounds it. You need to understand it. Put it into context. And the best thing when you're doing these things, we'll go back to studying, we go back to your note taking, is when you get something from there, you add it to this. Because this is your record. So that you can go, oh, I can't remember. A couple days later, I can't remember what that was. You look it up. But what you want to do is now, how do I take notes, okay? So here's one method. Here's the math method. And then I'm going to tell you a few tricks on how to effectively get your notes in a very busy class. Okay. So this column is my book. Okay. Ahead of time. I go in and do my work in the book editor. This is lecture. Okay. So now I do that. So this middle column, book blank. I leave, when I'm taking my bulk notes, this is the method I use. So I go and I take big spaces, and then now I have all of this space to take my lecture notes for each topic. Then what do I do? I go back and I use the third column, that middle column, the second column, technically. I go back and I use that second column to fill in the spaces for matching these points up. I have this, I have that, but now I need to add real life examples or I need to go back and I need to do my research and I need to fill that in and I need to understand that. So this is the method I use. So now you may ask, Professor, why is there a third column that you didn't use on this one? Well, because what I can do is all I'm going to write is time weighted average or all I'm going to do is write, uh, I'm not writing anything else. Now I might put in parentheses um, you know, let's say this is down here, let's say I wrote bones in the body, okay? Um, and then I might write um, something like I need to know there's five areas of the body that I need to break the bones up from. So I need to break up the spine, I need to break up the um, 
the bones of the skull, then I need to know the bones of the um, of the extremities, whatever it is. So whatever whatever the case may be, but I might just rank five. Okay, this is a note for me to know that there's five separate areas that I need to know the bones of. Okay, so this is kind of like the cheat sheet. So now I'm going to take another piece of paper, and when I take that another piece of paper, okay. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover up my notes. My paper would be the same size as the other paper. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to cover up my notes. And that all I do is I expose this color. So now I'm quizzing myself. Time weighted average. Oh, that is time weighted average is 0.5 and 0.75. Ooh, 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 I'm right. Okay. Uh, Visible exposure limit is two parts per million. Ooh, 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 I'm right. Right? Bones. Okay. So now I go down. And now I am. Um, um, now I'm quizzing myself because I told you I'm one person that cannot make flashcards because by the time I made the flashcards, there's no time to study. So what do I do? You use a method like this. You've already taken the notes. Why are you rewriting? Okay? I don't have time for that. So what I do is I can cover up part of the notes and I can go down because I made my notes quizzable. I made my notes in a fashion that I could go back and I don't have to make flashcards. I can just go down the page and I can study them. Now, there's a couple other um, methods. So one other method to study uh, before I go into how to how to get your effective on your notes and how to uh, be effective is, let's say we have a, a page uh, from the textbook. I'm going to photocopy a page. Now, don't plagiarize or anything like that. But photocopy a page from the textbook that maybe has a chart, like a, like a table on it, or uh, photocopy a page that has, uh, has paragraphs of information that have lots of information, lots of numbers, lots of whatever. So I'm going to take that page and I'm just going to run it through the photocopier or I'm going to scan it, whatever the case may be. Then I'm going to take white it. Okay? Again, you can save paper if you scan it, white things out like on a PowerPoint thing, then hit print, or just white them out, put text boxes over, uh, over them on PowerPoint. And then I know everyone likes things electronically now. So you, make each page a PowerPoint slide, and then you just take a, uh, a text box and you cover up significant words, okay? Don't cover up uh, words that don't mean anything. Cover up numbers. Cover up significant terms. Cover up significant parts of that. Don't cover up too much. You want much to work with. But as you're going, then I put a text box over that, or the traditional way of pre-technology is that we would photocopy that page, then use whiteout, and then you just white out those spaces. So now what I do is so now we have all of this thing, numbers missing, whatever the case may be. Um, and you get the gist, okay? So here's the paper, and you have whited out spaces, text boxes over it, whatever the case may be. Now let that sit for a little bit. Let that sit for a couple days and then go back to it. So now when you go back to it, what you're doing is you're reading, reading those areas and it may be you fill in, right? You fill in the spaces with your answers. You're quizzing yourself. You're quizzing yourself in context, right? You made it, you read the stuff, but in context you are uh, answering the fill in the spaces, fill in the boxes. Now go back to your textbook. When you open your textbook or open your notes, you can photocopy your notes and do the same thing. But when you when you go back to your textbook and you read that paragraph and you find the answers and quiz yourself to see, did you actually know those answers? Okay, did you actually know um, the missing words, the instruments, the numbers, the um, the techniques? Right? We blocked out. We didn't block out other words. We blocked out you know types of drainage, concurrent intermittent, alternate. So continuous, things like that. Those are the words you're talking about. Numbers. So then you go through and you fill those spaces in and see how well you did. That's a great way. Again, easy, doesn't take the time of making flashcards, doesn't do any of that if that is time consuming for you. Uh, and once you scan that, you don't have to worry about um, you know, rewriting or something. You can just erase everything. You have other copies of it, whatever it is. But, and you can just keep quizzing yourself. Keep quizzing yourself until you know everything. When you read the paragraph, you can fill in the spaces. Um, that greatly helps you. Another thing is auditory. So 
when I read the textbook, I might, if I do read the paragraph, I'm reading it out loud. Um, there was a point where you had to have extra words. Now your cell phone, just use the apps on there. We record ourselves to the app. And then when you go, um, when you're in driving, you're in the car, you're doing laundry, you're doing something where you maybe can't do something else. Uh, maybe you have your, maybe you're going to the gym, you have your um, your pods and whatnot, headphones on, and you're just, while you can't do something else, while you're lifting or running on the treadmill, what you're doing is you're listening to yourself read that textbook. Or you're listening to yourself explain a topic, same thing, record yourself when you're talking to your family friends, put a recorder down, put your phone down, record yourself given those explanations, and now go back and listen to your own lectures, give to your own reading, you know, you're giving your own audiobooks, and that will give you a different perspective on that material and help you retain it. So, now how do we take the proper notes? Okay, so, <clears throat> making sure I covered everything here too. Uh, okay, I think I did. So, the different methods here. So this is down to one of my markers. Um, so different methods that we could use. One is again, as I said, we, we speak fast. Uh, one thing to do is go ahead of time and make a key before the lecture. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make a page. And maybe I put that page next to me, right? I make a little cheat sheet. So then I just say uh, B N S equals bounce. Um, and then um, C R N equals cranium. Uh, but what, what you have to think about is some of these longer words, right? So if I have the thing, I'm trying to think of something good. Okay? But think about some of these really long words that we're going to be using, right? So, all of a sudden you have this thing and you're writing this out and you're like, all right, by the time, you know what, that professor has moved on three topics by the time you just got that one word written. So using abbreviations, you have to use the same ones, use standard abbreviations. So little tricks, uh, look at medical terminology in a lot of scientific classes, uh, you can, uh, anything medical related, if you use medical terms, that will speed things up drastically. Uh, if you can, if you can do that, uh, so start getting a medical terminology book, start studying that. But TX means treatment. Um, SX for surgery. Okay, but you can see how long it takes me to write a simple word. Okay, history is HX. Okay, you can see how long does it take me to write this compared to HX, SX, okay? Um, we can have um, with or without, right? So if you have, um, you know, with or without, okay? So again, see how long it takes me Okay, um, so knowing proper terminology, knowing proper abbreviations really does help because they can just kind of skip along and help you. But make up abbreviations for terms. Look through the chapter and then create this cheat sheet. And it sits next to you and you're like, add to your cheat sheet. Add to that cheat sheet of abbreviations that says, oh, in this chapter, they're going to talk. They're gonna be, I'm going to be typing the word, um, you know, different types of drainage. So I have alternate, I have continuous, and I have intermittent. Okay? So now I'm just gonna write those, I'm gonna write those on my um, on my cheat sheet, my my abbreviation sheet. So that way I always know if I have to look over, I know what I'm doing, but I can memorize, okay, these are the these are the abbreviations and make them simple. Don't make anything complex, but make sure they're also not the same. Um, and you know, again, um, maybe you're talking about different instruments. Again, trying to abbreviate what instrument you would do for what. Make abbreviations for keywords, especially things that are longer. Um, just so that you can, or things that you write commonly. Um, and that one, it will save a lot of paper space so that you can keep moving. Otherwise, you're trying to write these things and you have no space to write. 
of any of your other notes to it just you move so much better writing and shorthand. Uh, and you're going to keep moving along. All right. So other things is using uh, imagery. So if you can leave spaces, right? So now going ahead and let's say I from the book, um, I can take. Uh, they now sell printers. You can do little stickers. I think those are great as well. Uh, but maybe you just take some like a glue stick. So print out a picture. I want to. This lesson is going to include the arteries and the veins of the body. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to print out an image of the arteries of a body from. You can find so many images online. Just look on look on your web search and find a body with arteries or veins. So now I put this body picture um, that I printed out. I used a glue stick and I just I just made it the proper size for that section of my note. Or maybe it is the page. Maybe I printed it and I just made a whole page. I stuck it in my notebook. I glue sticked it to the entire page. It's full page size. That's awesome. And now I can label. Okay, this is where I'm going to inject here. This is where I'm going to inject there. And I can write if this, if that. Okay. If the person's a dentist, I do this. If the person has decomp, I do this. Now I have this body image that I can work off of. So much easier. So much better to work off of you, 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 but you have to do your homework. You can't in the middle of class be Googling images. You need to, ahead of time, get your images straight, get those images in the book, and get ready so that you all you're doing is you're drawing and you're taking notes on those. If you want to know the parts of an embalming machine, print out a picture of an embalming machine. Put it in there. If you're trying to learn whatever you're trying to learn, put it in a page and then start drawing on that and start labeling. This is pressure. Pressure can be automatic sometimes. Sometimes not. This is rate of flow. What is rate of flow? Write it. Well, while you're in lecture, you're writing, you're doing things ahead of time, and then you're writing them in lecture as well. But again, doing your homework and having the imagery does do a great job because now you're picturing when you're studying that. Um, you're not taking notes and going, oh, now I've got to find an image and i got to remember what goes to what part of the image. You did your work ahead of time. Very important. Uh, I talked about abbreviations. And then your bonics would be using acronyms. Uh, make something up that makes sense to you. Okay. Make something up that there are some basic ones that we all learn. Uh, professors will oftentimes give one, so write them down, and that will help you. Uh, but it has to make sense to you. If it doesn't make sense to you, then maybe you're into cooking. Maybe you're into bike riding or hiking or skiing or uh, pick something. Okay? Pick something that means something to you because if you were a law enforcement officer before going into this, before going back to school, you can relate something to law terms, law enforcement terms, fire. You can relate things to that. If you are, if you were into baking and culinary skills, maybe you can relate things to terms that you've heard before, things that make sense to you, and you can start using acronyms um, that will help you remember, right? Maybe your acronym was red and you're doing whatever it's, but it has to make sense. And it doesn't have to make sense to anybody else. It has to make sense to you. And that's where we go wrong, okay? We learn a lot of times as Professors will give acronyms, fellow students will say, oh yeah, I use this acronym. And we try to use somebody else's acronym. We try to use somebody else's learning mechanism. Make your own. Okay, Make something that makes sense to you. Um, and then also coin sayings. Sing songs, make stuff. Um, and then sometimes that may make sense to nobody else. But the saying that you have will help you all of a sudden remember something. Okay. Talking about prion diseases. And you're like, oh yeah, my fake aunt Margaret was, was dizzy and shaking. She had memory loss. And she walked like a drunk against the fence. Okay, she had a taxi. And she jerked, like Parkinson's jerks. So what did you do? Okay, you didn't say, all right, what was the signs and symptoms of, of, of her prion? What you did do was you made up a fake family member, or maybe you do have a maybe you remember, you're like, oh yeah, I remember my friend Bob had 
uh, had something like this. I remember that he had these things. So maybe, but you make something up. Make up your fake family members and you give them symptoms. Oh yeah, Aunt Margaret had this. Bob had that. Jimmy had this. And by doing that, you can give you can give somebody a story, a fake person a story, or maybe a real person, give them a story. I used to make fun of people, I make fun of my brother. And what I did was I got through my vocab, as I, I remember it, uh, as a child, right? They gave you those vocab books, you had to learn so many vocab words a, a, a week. Then you had to teach them back to you know, you know, back to the classroom, take quizzes on. And I remember it because I would make fun of people in good humor, but I would make fun of my brother. I'd start calling him nicknames from my dog. Hey, you're this, hey, you're that. He didn't appreciate it. One of those nicknames still sticks, um, still to this day. Uh, I still call my brother by one of those vocab words. <laughs> so uh, it's not his real name. I'm the only one that calls him that, but everyone knows who I'm referring to when I say it. <clears throat> but that's how I remembered these vocab words. Because I started attributing things to other people's behaviors. Oh, this person's cantankerous. This person is, you know, this. This person is part that. You know, the local. The, the local auto dealership, uh, the person's last name was part of one of these vocab words. Ah, a car salesman, oh, and it didn't have to apply to them, but I made something up. I pretended the car salesman at this dealership, which had part of this vocab word as their last name on the sign, must have this personality, this type of attribute. They didn't, but it helped me remember <clears throat> what the vocab word was because I gave them a personality that they didn't otherwise have. So again, doing things like that, making your own point sayings, making your things up. I'll give you sometimes you can attribute things. I remember my grandmother, when I was really young, I don't remember how many feet are in a mile. Uh, today I can still tell you it's 5,280. How do I remember that? Well, because my grandmother was really good at these things um, and she taught me a lot of different uh, things. Um, everything I had to learn, she would call my grandmother and she'd come up, ah, hold on, I came up with a way to do it. She'd make up a story. And I'd remember these things by the story that she told me. Incredible. Some of those things I'd forgotten a long time ago. But how many feet are a mile? Still to this day I remember. Why? Because five people went into the desert. Two ate nothing. 5,280. Five, two, eight, zero. Five people in the desert, two, eight, nine. 5,280 feet in a mile. So, again, it doesn't have to make sense to you. Make sense, it doesn't have to make sense to anybody else. It has to make sense to you is what I meant to say. Uh, again, note-taking, studying, doing all of this is extremely, uh, it's its own topic. Okay, so I'm glad you came to us today. I'm glad that we went through this. Uh, if you have questions, please, I'm here. I'm willing to answer your uh, questions while I'm still here. So um, I'll stay after, uh, no problem. Uh, but at any time, I'm available. So reach out. Uh, again, it's creative. You have to get creative. But to recap, find a place that you can study or you're not thinking of anything else. Focus. Okay? And if it's not in your house, if it's not in your workplace, go to the college, use the classrooms, go to the library, go find a quiet place that you can focus and you can study and that you can do that. Okay? Study in small bits of time, but incorporate it. Don't say, I don't have time to study. Incorporate it into your life. Okay? When you're doing the laundry, we're thinking, we're talking to ourselves. Talk to the dog. Talk to your children. Explain things to them. And just say, I need a few minutes of your day. Let me talk. While we're in a car ride, I'm going to drive or you're going to drive, but I'm going to go with you. But the deal is that for me to go with you, I get to explain. We're going on a road trip. We're going on a family vacation. That's awesome. A lot of people want to shut their minds off and say, nope, we're at vacation time. I respect that. But you know what? Every minute of your day is studying. So while you're on that vacation, just say, every day, I need to explain something. I don't need to bring textbooks with me. I don't need all of that. But every day, I'm going to explain to you something. 
Okay, deal. Okay, while you're in school, we make these rules for ourselves. Um, and again, if you're doing things in small bits, you're going to recommit to long-term memory. And a lot of it is repetition. The more times you do something, the more likely you are to remember. And the more ways you get it, the more likely you're to remember. If you read it, you spoke it, you explained it, you listened to it, you saw it, you watched a demonstration, you did it. It takes all of that to understand something. So don't forget that. Right? Um, and again, strive for the 90s. You need to understand this material to do that. And then taking notes. Taking notes is you need to do it properly. You need to keep up with the professor. Um, again, abbreviate. Uh, prepare. Prepare your notes ahead of time. Okay? Don't, don't walk into your lecture. I know I've done it myself. Don't walk into your lecture and just wing it. Okay? Pre-work, lecture work, during lecture work, and then go back and um, fill in the spaces afterwards. That's very, very important uh, <coughs> thing to do. All right, and then find techniques like pointing out uh, pages, um, using post and notes stuck to things, or quizzing yourself on different things. Uh, another method is to put things in as reminders in your phone. So that way, every so often, something pops up, right? A reminder. Remember, this is this, right? So instead of saying, you know, and while you're driving, you can talk to your phone. Remember that, right? Say, hey, Siri, remind me to do this. My phone's going to go off. <laughs> so will all yours. But hey, Siri, remind me to do this, right? We do all the time. Hey, Siri, remind me to that there's so many bones in the body. Remember that there's this. And you know, and my phone just went off. <laughs> okay, it just told you what. So, so now what happens is all of a sudden, hey, remind me at 9 a.m. tomorrow. Remind me at 10. So you're driving along and you're just telling the phone to remind you of these different things at different times. Cool. And you know what? Tomorrow morning, 9 a.m., you wake up to something that reminds you about a vocab word. Reminds you that something you open, you click on it on your phone and, you re and it reminds you. It gave you a daily reminder at 9 a.m. every day that you're reminded about about something. Something different. At noon, you're reminded something. At 2 o'clock, you're reminded something. So you can you can use the technology you have to your advantage uh, and you need to incorporate it, but whatever study techniques you've been using, most likely it's not working. Uh, but the biggest factor that most people have lost, and this is where you um, need to go, is get into the classroom. Look at your fellow colleagues and learn, because as I said when I started, was what we learn is when we're sitting next to someone, you look and say, I like what you're doing, teach me that, no taking that. Or when you walk by, you may be the quiet student, that's fine. When you're at home and that camera goes off or you shut off your, inter you know, when you shut off the, the portal, you have no communication. Okay, you think you do, but when you shut that off, all of a sudden that all goes away and whatever's around you is what you're thinking about. And then you have to think about turning that on. You have to think about going back to that class. So when you're in a classroom, it's different, right? So if you're remote or online, you have to work so much harder to get to the same place as your in-person counterparts. Because what's going to happen is your in-person counterparts are walking by the classroom and somebody else says, hey, professor, can you pull the anatomical models out of the closet? I want to study. Okay. So we pull them out and you learn. And then everyone else walks by and says, hey, can I join you? Yeah, sure. Let's work together. Let's quiz each other. Hey, can I get a model? I wasn't thinking about doing that. I didn't know they could grasp for those. Can I Can I get one too? Yeah, absolutely. Hey, why don't I photocopy? I had some study sheets that were in my file cabinet. I, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't used them in a couple years, but you know what? They may help you. Or you walk by and you say, hey, professor, I've been having trouble understanding something. Can you explain this to me? No, yeah, sure. I'm here. Let me explain that to you, okay? So you get people in passing. You have colleagues. You have classmates. You have professors. People in passing that can explain things to you that you don't otherwise have access to. Okay? You have to think, and you don't realize that you had that there was a question that you didn't know the answer to. You didn't think about asking that because you didn't know you didn't know it. You don't know what you don't know. But when someone else asks that question, you're like, I didn't know I didn't know that. So you need so that helps. But the other, um, the other factor is just that exposure. 
Because when you learn something, let's say it's a fourth semester course, and restorative arts are a good example, right? So I teach restorative art in the fourth semester. And I have freshmen that are actually, their classes are the exact same time, they're in the next classroom over. And when they leave that classroom, what do, your what do the freshman class do? They have to walk by. We're always doing something exciting. That's an exciting class. That's a hands-on laboratory class. And what do they do? They walk by and they look and go, wow, like, come on in, come join us. No one of those classes, come join us. Come see what we're doing. <clears throat> oh, that's so cool. Yeah, you want to play? Here. Here, you can put some gloves on. Join in. And you know what? Semester after semester, Sometimes they come back. And you know what? It's not during the class time where you don't learn the most. It is outside the classroom. It's when you're between classes, when you're, walk, when you're walking by other classes, and you join in. And you see what they're doing. Or they're explaining something. And upperclassmen are explaining something. You're like, oh, wow, that's so cool. But you saw them do something. That's so cool. Okay? And you learn these things. You're talking to them. And they're talking about what they're doing. And you get excited. Right? But what you're doing is semester after semester, by the time you got to that fourth semester, what I'm really hoping is that you've seen that done four times, or three times. You've done it three times, and you're doing it the fourth time. But you've observed three times before you got to that point. What you don't want to do is be closed off as a student. And then all of a sudden, your fourth semester comes, and you're walking in that classroom in these advanced classes for the first time. You've never seen what other people do. You don't even know what it should look like, what example is. Walk in. Learn. See what they do. See the results. See how they're doing it. I love the students that email me or text me and say, hey, professor, can I come in and just work? I know I'm not in that class. I have students that graduated. Hey, I know that I graduated, but do you mind if I come in and join into your classroom? I won't be a disturbance. Yeah, I don't disturbance. Come right in. And they join in and they sit there. And they want to learn a concept. I have students that say, hey, you hired a new professor. Can I sit in on their class too? I really love that topic. Can I, I want to learn from them. I want to learn, I learned good from you guys, but I want to learn from them. Yeah, come right in. As long as they don't mind, come right in. So this is the kind of stuff that you get when you come in person, take advantage of that opportunity, uh, and learn. Okay? Ask your professors, hey, can you mind if I join in? Do you mind if I observe that again? I know I've seen it before. Do you mind if I observe that before I get to that class? Let me see that. When you come back, say, I really want to practice. I did this well, but I was in classes and I was rushing. But I had to do it for class. Do you mind if I come back and just work on my head? I just want to improve what I did. Can I come back and refix it? Yeah, sure. We're here to help you. And you know what? My lab has the instruments that you don't have at home. I have the tools, the instruments, the everything, the resources. Come in. Because you know what? When you get out there and you're working, you may, you're going to most likely encounter the easy cases, simple cases. You don't get the complex ones every day. You don't. That's the reality. You don't. You get simple cases every day. But all of a sudden, that difficult case comes in once in a while. And you know what? You don't know how to handle it because you learned it in a micro fashion. You learned different things. But when you get exposed and you learn from somebody that's really good that maybe classes before or after you, and all of a sudden they do something and you're like, wow, that was really cool. Teach me that. Or you went back and you improved and you improved your skills. It's amazing what you can do because now you can tell your client, you can tell your family, you can tell your colleagues, I can do that. This is not something that we're just gonna push away. This is not a close casket experience. This is this. There are cases where you just can't fix things, but there's cases where I can say, give me a chance. I can do that, but it's just going to take time. Give me time, and I can do that, because the more experience that you get, and when you come across those cases, you know what? Be proud of yourself. Try, and if you fail, it's okay. Try again the next time, but you don't know unless you try, and that's how you learn. Keep looking for these learning opportunities, and if you get a good learning opportunity, you know what? Invite friends. Invite colleagues to learn with you. Because as a profession, we can grow if we learn together and we boost each other. Okay? We're never competition. We're colleagues. We work together. Yes, we fight for the same clients, but at the end of the day, we're colleagues. And 
When I need help, I call the guy down the street that can come and help me do a great job if he's better at it than I am. We all have our skills. But in that classroom, make friends. Because you know what? This goes long beyond studying. When you need something, when you need help, those are the people you're going to call. Those are the people you're going to rely on. So make friends. Okay? Make colleagues in the classroom. If they're going to help you study. Right? Maybe you're not really good at accounting. But you know what? This person is. You're really good at restorative art. And you can spend the time helping them with their restorative art skills. <clears throat> Maybe they don't have a plan to ever work in the basement of the funeral home. You do. That's fine. They plan to work upstairs. That's great. But you know what? You still need to get through it. And when something happens, you need to understand when you're talking to a family, that person that, that is uh, going to work with just with families and never going to work with the deceased, that person still needs to know because they need to explain to the family what's going to happen. They need to understand how long it's going to take to do that job. So work together as colleagues, as classmates. You help them, they help you, but there's a value to getting to know and working together as a team. And then later on, these are the people you call. All right, so again, I'm going to stick around. If any of you have, please fill out the evaluation. Um, if any of you have any questions, um, please, I'll stick around. I'm more than happy to answer those. Uh, but obviously, not everything comes in the moment. Uh, so I, I'll leave my contact information. If uh, you ever need to contact me, uh, I will be more than happy to help you find some creative way to take notes, creative way to study uh, if some of this doesn't make sense, or if you have a creative class where you need to kind of get creative with your note taking and your studying to learn that, I've probably seen it done before. Okay, I do have a very well rounded background, so I've probably seen or I probably have a friend or a colleague uh, that I watched study or I helped study, and I'm happy to pass that knowledge along uh, to you. Thank you.